welcome everyone uh, to today's discussion, focusing on uh, the current the current capital markets and deal making 2024 expectations, uh, a beaming horizon of opportunity, innovation, investments, and partnerships. Uh, so we created this webinar uh, really off the back of all of the positive activity. Uh, kicking off the year at JP Morgan uh, last month in January. Um, we decided it would be a great idea off the back of all of that new activity uh, to set a discussion focusing on what we are expecting within the market in 2024 and really to focus on a few up and coming trends. So I'm going to hand over to our moderator for today, uh, Ajahn Reginald, who is the Chief Executive Officer uh, of Rockfort Therapeutics. Um, if any attendees with us today have any questions for our panelists, please do use the Q&A function uh, at the bottom of the screen. Uh, we're gonna try and make this a very interactive webinar today. Uh, we have a few polling questions coming up for you also, uh, so do keep an eye out for those. Uh, so on that note, Ajahn, uh, I will hand over to yourself. Very good, thank you, Adam. And uh, great to be here with this great panel. Um, so we're going to start the panel with some very quick introductions, and we're going to try to keep those introductions to, to 30 seconds each, uh, and then we're going to jump into the first question. Um, so perhaps I'll, I'll kick off. I'm Ajahn Reginald. I'm Chief, Operate, Chief Executive Officer of Rockford Therapeutics, um, and also the founder of the Selixia Group of Companies. Prior to that, I was Global Head of Emerging Technologies at Roche and a deal maker as Business Development Director. Um, Tim, perhaps you'd like to introduce yourself next. Yes, thanks, uh, Ajahn. Uh, Tim Haynes, I'm a managing director with uh, Abingworth. Uh, prior to joining Abingworth, uh, going across to the dark side 19 years ago, I was a, a biotech CEO, one of the larger VCs globally, offices uh, UK, East and West Coast of the US. Um, and we are very broad in terms of stage. So we do very early stage investing, but all the way through to public market investing um, through secondaries where we'll take a board seat. And we have a, a speciality um, strategy, which is around supporting late stage uh, clinical uh, studies called clinical go development. Excellent. Thank you. Um, Jane? Yeah. Um, hi, everyone, and, and thank you for having me here today in this panel. Uh, my name is Jane Booth Lowers, and I'm the Corporate Vice President of Integrations and the Strategic Alliances in Novo Nordisk. Um, we are part of a corporate development function that spans from strategy to end-to-end um, -end business, de business development. Um, previously, from uh, for, before I joined Novo Nordisk, I was with AstraZeneca for 15 years, scientist by training, but has spent uh, most of my career working with deal making um, and, and business development across the value chain. And um, for us, obviously, right now, um, focus is um, on the uh, on the diabetes, obesity, uh, cardiometabolic space. Um, and for sure, Novo Nordisk is a company that has, re has received a lot of attention lately, but it's also um, a company where business development is becoming a more and more important part of, of the future. So um, very glad to be here today and uh, look forward to a good discussion. Brilliant, thank you, Jane. Uh, Marta, would you like to do a quick intro? Sure. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me. I'm Marta Helena Lesko. I'm a vice president and head of immunology and neurology business development team at Merck, uh, Merck KGA Darmstadt, Germany, just to uh, clarify any confusion, which is also known as EMD Serono in the US. So Merck Group is actually active in life sciences, electronics and healthcare. I'm part of healthcare and in healthcare on the innovative sort of R&D uh, efforts, we focus on oncology, immunology, and neurology, and also have more mature franchises on cardiometabolic endocrinology, as well as uh, fertility. Fantastic. Uh, and then, Mike, if I may, if I ask you to do an introduction, <coughs> and also perhaps lead us with kind of initial thoughts, our first question is going to be whether we believe that there are early signs of a positive trajectory in the public markets and in private investments. So... Um, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Good. Ajahn, thanks for having me. Um, so my name is Michael Rice. I'm the founder of Lifesite Partners uh, 14 years ago. My background worked at various different investment banks my entire career. Lifesite, we do a lot of different things. We have an IR practice, a PR agency, an investment bank where we raise capital for companies, We've been very, very active. We're investors as well. We have three venture funds, a long-only mutual fund, a search practice, 
a consulting business where we do licensing and partnering analytic work, commercial surveys, physician surveys, and we've got a fractional CFO business. So we've got offices all over the globe, about 400 people. That's me. That's the firm. I uh, hope that was quick enough. Um, the, 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 the question of the market and sort of where we stand right now, um, you know, as we talked about um, in our last discussion, I am really, I don't want to say ultra bullish because I don't want to sound too excited, but I am, I am very bullish for a bunch of different reasons. Um, I think first, the history of the market movements past these inflationary periods, you've seen over and over again, this sector do well. I think the next thing that I think about when we see deals being done, um, investor engagement that we do with a lot of our companies is that generalists are finally starting to come back and the retail world is rediscovering biotech. The other thing that, you know, we have lots of conversations with money wholesalers, which are, as you think about a money wholesaler, they're asset allocators, right? And asset allocators, without a doubt, are really interested in this sector where a year and change ago, they really didn't want to talk about it. Um, so I think there's a, a, a number of reasons why um, I'm very bullish, um, but I'm an optimist at heart. And I think at the end of the day, this is going to continue. I think there's lots of other reasons I can talk about, but I think I'll stop talking and give others a chance. No, that was a really good intro. Um... Would Jane, Marta, or Tim, how, how, would you like to respond? How are you feeling about the markets and private investments? Yeah, so, I mean, I can, I can start. I think I clearly share the the, the positive atmosphere. I'm also a, a positive person by, by nature. I guess it, it comes a little bit with the with the trade of BD. Uh, you have to see the opportunities rather than the risks, um, or at least balance them. But I think um, the there's still a lot of really, really strong innovation out there. Um, and uh, obviously, the, the 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 crucial thing is to find that innovation. Um, but I do think that uh, if there is good innovation and and uh, the unmet medical need is there, then uh, there is also a, a very uh, strong appetite for for deals. And certainly, we do see in the in the cardiometabolic space that there's a lot of competition around the good assets, and for good reason. So um, so I think I'm I'm very positive around the. The, the trend um, for us, it's also a matter of having a very clear strategic focus on what we're looking for, which from a from a bias perspective makes it very much easier to uh, to have efficient conversations and also to be able to drive the processes fast and and be competitive in in that um, in that space. Yeah, it's a immensely competitive space and huge growth uh, in the last few years. So it, it's interesting to see. How sort of new market almost um it's been there for a while but in in many in in many ways a, an additional market for pharma makes everything quite quite interesting um Marta do you agree or do you have a yeah I think you know at, at nature first of all I, I do agree I think business development people always need to see opportunities so I am also an optimist at heart but here I kind of need to restrain myself and be kind of uh, cautiously hopeful if you will Right. Uh, I think also I see a little bit of a different angle here. I'm heading now a neurology and immunology business development team where, of course, uh, these areas were not as heavily invested into as, for example, oncology in past years, although that is slowly changing, or of course, like obesity at the moment. And I think um, in a way, neurology and immunology is benefiting from all the attention that obesity is getting because it's sort of catalyzing the change of mindset that, uh, you know, there, there are other unmet needs and other uh, sort of opportunities beyond oncology. So from that perspective, I am optimistic. But in terms of um, what I observed at JP Morgan, for example, um, maybe, yes, there was no uh, sort of intense sense of desperation, as uh, some of you mentioned during Jeffries. But I think the sort of the the positive uh, general market uh, sort of um, changes have not trickled down yet to uh, to sort of what I observe, right? So there are still a lot of uh, companies uh, that are either uh, struggling to raise raise funds. So for example, they say, yes, we have investors, uh, but nobody wants to lead the syndicate, for example, or uh, there are companies that realize that they have, you know, splashed out on, uh, with their cash a little bit too much, gone too broad, and now basically 
are looking to partner anything in their portfolio to, to say, say their clinical asset, for example, and so on. So I think it will take some time before markets move and people start investing and then uh, we see all of that also coming down to, um, you know, sort of also new innovation being being brought to, to pharma. So at the moment, I also see a lot of sort of shortage on, on novel targets. So these targets uh, are definitely, you know, attracting um, very competitive bidding processes and also some companies still deciding to, to retain certain targets for themselves if they have been fortunate enough to raise the money right before uh, the downturn. Right, so I think it's it's sort of a mix. I think it really comes down to how good you know the data behind your pipeline is ultimately. But I wouldn't say it's it, it's definitely not there uh, in terms of going back to to the COVID boom and and probably from my perspective, it maybe shouldn't also go back there because that was an anomaly looking to how where the baseline was for many years before, right? No, absolutely, that makes sense. Um, and Tim? Yeah, look, I, I think, um, you know, Mike's optimistic viewpoint, I think, you know, we as a firm share, um, I'm always reminded of the adage, you know, history never repeats itself, but it often rhymes. And I think we've, you know, we've been around 50 years and we've seen many of these cycles. And I think we do need to spend a couple of minutes just looking back at the recent history, because I think it does and will have a significant impact on where we're heading, certainly for the next couple of years. And I think, um, you know, we need to remind ourselves that there's still nearly 200 companies on NASDAQ with a negative enterprise value. So the first thing I think we've really got to get through is, is funding those companies over this year. The, the secondary is in January really good. I think about $6 billion was raised. Um, uh, and I think, you know, many of these companies raised quite a bit of capital two to three years ago. And we're now getting to the point where they're going to need to go back to raise capital. So I think in some way, certainly the public markets are going to be somewhat constrained uh, until either of these companies have merged. And there's, by the way, there's been fewer mergers than I think some people expected kind of gone out of business or they repriced themselves and, and raised the capital they need. So I think if you then, you know, think a little bit about uh, IPOs in that context, obviously, you know, we came off um, 2020. Let me get make sure I get my uh, numbers correct, but we came off, um, uh, yeah, 2021, excuse me, it was 80 um, IPOs, and we've had, you know, just about got into double digits in the last two years. Um, and I think until we kind of cleared up some of those negative enterprise values, I think IPOs will be difficult. Um, I think you are likely to see um, probably, uh, you know, if you, if you ask me to um, you know, put my put my hand on my heart. I think we may be in the twenties to thirties. I don't. I think we're a long way off the the kind of eighties going back a couple of years. And I think the the other fundamental thing that we see is the type of companies um, that are doing well and those that are likely to float. And I think um, again in the um, you know in the eighty vintage of two years ago, about a third were pre pre clinical uh, companies. And I I think we're now in a world where actually data is going to drive everything and that's not only ipo potential but clearly uh, what's happening in uh, in m a and acquisitions and you know i think good news 2023 about 150 billion uh, dollars worth of m a uh, twice as much as the prior year but most of it later stage clinical um and it's still and this year has kind of got off to a great start uh, one of the companies we're involved with sema bay uh, acquired by gilead but uh, I think that the data piece, if you really drill into it, um, wherever you are, you, you've really got to figure out how private or public, you've got to figure out how you get to that data. And it's, it's some of it is, is extraordinary. We, we are, uh, just to finish, we're investors in a company called Salino, uh, Prader Willi syndrome, rare disease. This time last year, it was a $1 share price. Uh, the data read out a couple of weeks ago, a couple of months ago, excuse me, it's now just under $50, right? Because the data was so compelling. So I think, uh, and what is that about? That's really about pharma underwriting public and private valuations and getting into right. a zone where uh, M&A is, is like to support the exit. So I think that's, you know, there's a lot of nuances here. I think broadly, you know, really, you know, the macro environment's great, very bullish, but it's, um, I think you've got to, certainly as an investor and a biotech CEO, you've got to figure out, um, you know, whether you can get to the sweet spot, either for M&A um, and or uh, IPA opportunities. No, that's really helpful and a, and a really good segue, because I think 
you know, we're, we're doing pretty well on time. And I think it would be worth unpacking some of those fundamentals because we have different perspectives on the panel. I think the panel's well put together. And, and so maybe we could explore that a little bit. And maybe if I could set the stage a little bit for that. So, you know, pharma um, has a patent cliff, um, which is typically around, you know, talked about 2030, 2031, 2032. There's some big revenues um, over the last few years for some companies from COVID, some other companies wildly successful in the cardiometabolic um, uh, new indications. And as, as Tim pointed out, there's been a paucity of companies that have been able to list. So there's only been one way for many investors to exit, which is through M&A. Um, now, as, as markets open, are we going to see a return to dual track? Are we going to see, you know, company, is that, is that perhaps not this year or next year, but are we going to return to a point where the fundamentals support more public and private investments? Michael, or who, who, would, who would like to perhaps start with that? You're on mute. Thank you. <laughs> it's hard for me. Um, I'm happy to to talk about that and, and and just continue to talk on Tim's point. You know, the interesting concept that Tim brought up is the the negative enterprise value of a lot of the companies that are out there that are public, right? And that the the count of these negative EV science companies dropped from 158 to 150. We haven't seen this few negative enterprise value companies since April of 22. That's pretty amazing to me because we used to talk about negative enterprise values for 300 plus companies all the time. The other thing is, is when you think about the capital markets and what's going on is um, like last week, we took a little bit of a break from IPOs. Tim touched on this, but um, you know, Prior to that, in, in the in the follow-on world, almost $2 billion, 18 different offerings, that's just a massive amount of money, right? And that's $4 billion in follow-ons in, um, in, in January. February was sort of on, is on the same sort of pace, but I think it's just amazing the amount of money that is flowing into the sector. Anyway, as far as um, M&A goes, obviously... We know SEMA Bay. We've worked with SEMA Bay. We've been part of their transactions. Over it's an amazing deal that um, that Sue Joel and the Gilead folks um, cut, and obviously the Zoma deal, and lots going on in M and A. And on Friday, I'm sure everybody saw that there were a bunch of rumors going around as far as other companies like Springworks and Viking and all these companies trading up substantially. Um, I do think the dual track, uh, John, which you mentioned, where companies have the ability to raise public companies with good data have the ability to raise 200, 250, 300 million dollars overnight, which is amazing to me. Um, and that dual track, I do believe, is going to continue where because they have that capital on their balance sheet and they've got that flexibility, they're going to be able to go down either one of these tracks. So if you're asking me, do I think M&A is going to continue? I absolutely do. But I think it's going to be for those companies um, that have, as Tim mentioned, super strong data, unique and novel MOAs, and going to be companies that have flexibility. They're going to ultimately decide, their boards are going to decide to take the right price. That's my view. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess just very quickly, and I'd, I'd love to hear the, the top two farmers' views of, uh, of what their appetite is. But I, I guess the, the other quite encouraging thing is the breadth of, of parties, of counterparties for biotechs is not only the, the large pharma groups that are obviously represented today, but you've seen quite a bit from the mid-caps, so Chiesi, Ipsen, Sobe, Ironwood, uh, and others. So I think that's really uh, is quite encouraging. And I think to to your point, uh, Adrian, if you, you know, Pick, pick your number of, as to what the pattern cliff's going to look like, but it's, you know, arguably up to 300 billion over the next six plus years all across pharma. So pharma, you know, I think the pharma model has changed dramatically. Um, you know, 25 years ago, less than 20% of pharma's pipeline was in license. Today, it's pushing nearly 70%. So I think that really underpins everything that we do. And I think we should all be, um, you know, extraordinarily positive um, uh, about that number of acquirers has grown. Obviously, there's a huge amount of cash. Uh, and obviously, groups like Novo uh, don't quite know what to do with their cash. <laughs> and uh, we've got some ideas for them, of, of course. But, uh, uh, you know, it'd be great to hear, uh, you know, kind of the farmer's view of of, of how they think about um, 
uh, acquisitions and uh, um, you know private and public, I guess, and um, perhaps even more so what's on their hunting list. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm happy to start that. I think I think for for us, obviously, it's um, it's a matter of whether you want to dive deep into the areas of your specialty or if you want to broaden out. And, uh, and I think that's in general the, the choices that, that farmers have um, and, uh, and, and that will inevitably be, be directing where the, where the appetite for, for acquisitions or collaborations, uh, licensing and so on uh, happen. Um, what we have chosen is to, to double down on the areas where we are strong and where we know that we have a, a, a good and strong position in the future to, to be really strongly competitive, also to be able to present as many choices to the patients as possible, namely uh, diabetes and, and now obesity. But also we have at the same time chosen to, to widen the scope, but, but not too wide, widely outside of our, our core, namely to, to the cardio space and the cardio renal space. Um, for us, uh, rare uh, blood disorders continue to be um, an important uh, part of, of the future. And, and uh, this is primarily, this is a different dynamic from a, um, from a, a pharma model perspective, a different cost dynamic as well, and, and potentially even a different dynamic from, a, um, from an LOE perspective. So, so that's, a, that's another way that obviously farmers can 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 spread um, uh, the the focus, but I think um, in terms of, of when and and where to act, um, I think we see a lot of of of, uh, of appetite to for biotechs to start doing a collaboration and pushing for for that rather than uh, than a full exit. And and to me, that is obviously uh, as long as you have the choice from a from a cash flow perspective and are able to 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 push that way, it it of course generates a, an additional um, opportunity for the biotech to contribute to the value generation themselves and 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 thereby um, be in an even even more attractive position in terms of an exit. Um, so while it is uh, for us, it's 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 not only M and A or or partnering. It is really um, depending on the opportunity at at uh, at hand and uh, for us the the fit into the strategic focus is is much much more important to make sure that we can contribute with our strengths um and complement what is what is out there um rather than just building a an, another leg that that might be a little bit more distant to the core that's really helpful thank you marta would you like to comment yeah absolutely i think uh I, I would also I think Tim mentioned sort of about sourcing uh, innovation externally. So uh, sort of we also publicly uh, roughly more than a year ago now announced a, a little bit of a change of a model that we'll be sourcing uh, our sort of innovation basically externally uh, sort of with a goal uh, actually to source between fifty to sixty percent of uh, the pipeline externally, which is a, a big shift from for our organization. Uh, so I think that, that sort of seems to be a common thing among uh, many pharma companies, of course, due to uh, looking how to be more efficient. Uh, and that theme obviously always was sort of there for biotechs, but I think it's even more getting more and more important for pharma. And we have seen it through multiple announcements sort of shaking the industry, right? But um, in terms of deal types, maybe, uh, I would say similarly, as Jane mentioned for us, it, it's not about what deal type are we going to do? It's first, is there strategic fit? Can we also bring some, are there basically are the capabilities synergistic? Can we maximize the value of the asset? Uh, is that the right type of asset? Can we do the justice to the asset, right? We are also not, you know, we are a large pharma company, but also quite focused. So when we partner, we partner because we really believe in a certain asset and we really want to make sure that it reaches the market. So I think that, that's sort of, uh, the, the lens that we are looking through. So whether it's m a or whether it's licensing, uh, but you know, but it needs to be discussed so depending on many drivers, but also we are very strong believers in power of collaboration. So we tend not to do so many, we grab the asset and, and you never hear back from us again, kind of deals rather there is always a lot of um, collaborative effort components and sort of the party stays on uh, for quite some time to also act as an advisor, et cetera. And then in terms of um, 
in terms of where we are focusing at the moment, I would say the, the first main driver is, of course, the animal need and, uh, and about something, but uh, sometimes still biotechs that come to us to pitch, uh, interestingly, forgot to uh, forgot to mention from, from the start, right? They come, we have this exciting innovation, but yes, tell me, tell me what is it going to do to the patients? What is the, the sort of the benefit for the patients? Is it a small increase or is it a paradigm shifting? How, how you know, how big is the potential here, right? Then of course, uh, something that we didn't touch on yet, but I think it's on top of the mind of everyone is looking for IRA resistant pockets, right? But we don't know how things will pan out yet in, in detail, and but there is definitely that focus is, is there. On the sort of now going a little bit more uh, into, in, into zooming in, so to say on American specifically on neurology and immunology, I would say at the moment, we are of course looking to diversify away from MS. So uh, of course we had uh, not so uh, great news uh, that had shaken the industry and everyone else, but uh, is developing a BT case, but um, it is what it is, data, data is, and we can't change it. So on our side, for example, some of the areas where we identified high in med need would be neuromuscular types of diseases. And I also noticed that someone typed into the chat a question about uh, acute illnesses such as stroke and traumatic brain injury. And I, I, I almost had to smile reading this because that's one of the areas that we actively are looking for in organic opportunities. Primarily, of course, given where the company is at the moment, uh, at sort of late stage opportunities, but equally, uh, I would say sort of lead optimization is currently our sweet spot with where we are looking for exciting neuroinflammatory uh, targets. Um, of course, novel targets are always welcome, but equally uh, also focused on uh, sort of, um, how should I say, novel approaches to dragging the undragable targets, right? I think that, that's sort of, there are a couple of these uh, yep. pots of gold, if you will, uh, where everyone has been struggling uh, to, to kind of uh, tackle these targets. And I think that, that's something that we, we find quite exciting uh, as well. And of course, uh, hoping that, uh, for example, targeted protein degradation or AI powered drug discovery will help us to, uh, to do that. And uh, to that end, we have closed a couple of deals last year. So yeah, I, I think that's sort of where we stand at the moment in terms of uh, partnering and our outlook for and book of work uh, for the next year. Yeah, it'd be great to, I suppose, get a sense. Um, so, so, so one comment and then one one question. I think you're right. And we saw it last year. We saw um, Sanofi did a deal with Re Reclidux for Stat6, which has been undruggable theoretically for 20 years. Uh, and that was a $1.2 billion deal. So I think there is another macro, which is there are new indications, new targets, now improvement, um, machine learning, AI, helping us to find ways of drugging, you know, attacking un what used to be undruggable targets. There's many areas for growth. But do you, do, do, the, do the, the pharma folks think this is a year where you'll end up doing more deals um, than last year? Or, or how do you kind of see the competition? Hmm. That's an interesting question, I would say. So then we, uh, we had a conversation about it a couple of days ago, right? But sort of uh, yeah. uh, during the pandemic bubble, if you will, uh, there were almost the uh, companies were basically saying, oh, we don't need to, we don't need you. We don't need to partner. We have just raised such a substantial round. Wow. And um, yes, definitely. Of course, we have, we have seen that it's now buyer's market. That's no secret. So, but also one needs to not be attracted to the price, but to what is innovative, right? So, mm -hmm. I think there is more choice at the moment. And I think a mandate for, for us is definitely do more deals overall, given how we are sourcing innovation, but it's also doing the right deals. And I think that is that is very important not to, not to kind of uh, do deals for sake of deals, but do deals that fit the strategy, that can do the justice to the asset and equally address the animate need that is on the market. And, and then Jane, perhaps you comment and then Michael yeah. and and Tim, perhaps you could talk about your portfolio companies as well. Yeah, and I, and I think uh, I mean I certainly uh, echo with Marta the the I mean not not deals for the deal's sake, but really to uh, to follow the strategic need. Um, and and for us um, in Novo Nordisk, it means an increased um, focus and an increased appetite. 
uh, because of the of the um, of the or in the areas that I mentioned before. But I also think, and there's a there's a question in the poll here uh, or in in the chat about um, digital. Uh, biomarkers and I think the digital space in general and, and what we in in Novo call 5D so the 4Ds around the drug the device the the digital the data and the diagnostics I see um, a lot of increase in in uh, both appetite but also need to partner in those areas uh, probably not as much MA because these are are more broadly applicable and and you would be uh, you might narrow the field of, of use too much by by um, by having it in a home of a um, of a um, of a focused pharma company, but certainly deals in in terms of partnerships, collaborations, co developments, and even commercial partnerships where 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 these uh, go hand in hand. And there, I think it's it that that is uh, there's a lot of growth there, um, and there is a lot of innovation. Uh, and and there, it's really about finding those um, both um, biomarkers and and data that can enable a difference uh, either from a regulatory perspective or uh, yeah. in real real world evidence um, and and help the patient um, improve compliance and and ultimately outcomes so a lot of focus on that Very yeah, good. maybe just to unpack a little bit from the in investor side and you know a really helpful view of, of what farmers looking at what farmers doing um, uh, and I guess just on the uh, you know private VC side, some of the data is is really intriguing, um, uh, and I'll, I think I'll, I'll try and give some explanation for it. So, Q4 last year, uh, only 50 startups were created, um, which is I think is kind of the lowest level for about 10 years. However, there was still five billion dollars that went into life science investing. So, um, one one interpretation of that is, you know, there's still a lot of companies that you know later stage, public and private, that. Uh, where you can invest your capital at uh, pretty good valuations. I think there is a piece of that. But I also think there's a little bit about the changing uh, environment into which we're investing, given farmers' appetite and what we need to demonstrate. So I think one thing is that the fundings, just given the numbers I've given you, the, the quantum of capital per deal is going up. Um, and I think that's a reflection uh, partly of this um, data, the need to get to critical data before you're going to get a, a really good appetite. So you've got to take these companies much longer um i also think some of the appetite from pharma uh, has changed clearly we've talked a little about obesity neurology some of these newer indications um but i think more generally it's about things that really move the dial and we have seen the last three to four years you know move away from rare diseases um i think oncology is still in play people have talked about you know the the, the, the waning and the, the the death of oncology i don't think that is that is true by the way but there is certainly some move away from that. So I think um, these indications, again, are pretty tough to demonstrate data. These are not small market opportunities like rare diseases. So I think that's also driving kind of the quantum capital um, going into these uh, individual spaces. So I think there is, um, we view it as a little bit of barbell uh, opportunity. I think early stage, um, you know, really breakthrough technologies, and I'll give you a couple of examples, I think it's, it's still a great place to invest if you like traditional VC. Uh, and then we view it much more as a later stage um, where you can hopefully, you know, build a syndicate, public or private, to generate the data that um, you believe is, is going to get pharma and all the public markets excited. I think the bit in the middle remains a bit of a challenge. Um, I think both uh, in terms of the amount of cash you need to get to that data, but also the valuations haven't quite yet come down or reflected public markets in the you know series B, C's, D's for some companies. And I think you know venture capitalists always think their their children are beautiful, um, in, in spite of uh, perhaps patently obvious the fact that they may not be. Um, so I think that's a that's a bit of a, a challenge too. So we we certainly we we like late stage currently, and obviously the you know negative enterprise value piece that there, there is some opportunities and this real arbitrage between pre-data and post-data. I gave Salino as an example of that. So if you can pick it, you know, really dig into the, the phase one, phase two data, and you can bridge it through to the, the, the farmer sweet spot zone, I think that's a really interesting opportunity for investors like us and others. I think on the early stage, I think as, as we've heard from our two uh, farmer uh, colleagues, 
Um, I think that the world is as it was, and arguably, I think fantastic. You know, we're at the foothills of a lot of this stuff. Some great early technologies, gene therapy, CRISPR. You know, we we've been involved in in many of these areas. We're now in a kind of what I call a, a reduction to practice phase. We've got to convert these technologies into um, something that that you know really looks like a medicine. Um, so I think you know we're in next generation gene editing. Investing in the company earlier this year. I think AI. We've spent a lot of time um, tracking the space for many years. We've just done our first AI deal alongside Nvidia on the West Coast, a company called Ambic, um, which is using uh, predictive powers of AI uh, around um, structural biology. And I think obviously you know Google DeepMind massively impressive moving the available crystal structures or at least available three-dimensional structures of proteins from about 17 percent of i don't know 22,000 proteins um clearly deep mind got it up to about 98 percent but that's really only half the story and what iambic's looking to do is to um use these tools to predict what happens in the presence of the ligand or the drug i.e the conformational change piece that uh, rather than just the apo structure so we think that's a really uh, interesting area where ai will do more than what it certainly will do which is improve productivity and speed i think it's for us as always as venture groups it's what's what's the intellectual property what can these tools do that um, you can't achieve experimentally or get there eventually uh, through a more reductionist approach. So we think structural approaches are really interesting. And then the last piece is, is I, I think, and, and Jane touched on it, you know, we moved, I mean, goodness, we did Selexa high throughput genomic sequencing many years ago. We did, we uh, then went into liquid biopsies. I think, you know, we, uh, the whole industry struggled with diagnostics, um, very tough places to make returns, but uh, it does feel like we're entering a, a world where precision medicine pay for performance is, is going to increasingly require um, the industry as a whole to know what the patient stratification, which patients are going to respond to these drugs, not only to improve outcomes in clinical studies, but probably to get paid as well. So we're certainly paying a lot more attention to um, some of these, you know, broadly biomarker related uh, uh, discovery tools. I think the whole immune system is something I'm particularly interested in. No, nobody's really looked that hard at, um, you know, what an individual's immune system looks like, uh, you know, in the presence of disease or in the presence of the drug. Uh, ironically, uh, you know, that's even in spite of us having checkpoint inhibitors, we're actually using an individual's immune system as the drug. <laughs> so I think that's an example. And I think the whole omics space is another interesting one. So I'll, I'll stop there, but hopefully that gives you a little bit of a flavor for, for what we're thinking about uh, as we invest currently. No, very helpful. Um, and, and then, Michael, um, you, I suppose you've heard all the perspectives now. It, it, do you think there's a big difference between the, the US and Europe in your view? Um, or are those trends? I think I think there is and always has been this sort of arbitrage between Europe and the U.S. And I think part of that is just because of the larger pool of, of investors in the U.S. I think what's interesting um, in some of these discussions is these acquirers, the large caps, the mid caps, have conviction to make larger bets, which, again, haven't seen for a little while, particularly financed by debt. Biogen, Riata, Pfizer, Cgen, uh, Stellis, Iveric. Um, and the other thing which is really interesting to us as we take a step back and look at pharma and sort of their behavior is that they can be purposeful and open to these sort of innovative structured deals like we just saw in Sanofi and Hibrex, right? That was a really interesting transaction. Pfizer and Biohave and Takeda and Protagonist. When, when we sort of think about M&A, when we think about targets and, you know, interesting, you know, modalities, new modalities, we, we were investors in Ray's Bio, which was obviously brought by uh, BMS. Super interesting to us. So that's, I don't know if that answers your question, Ajahn, but that's kind of how we think about things, what we're looking at, how we think about Europe versus the U.S. We haven't done a lot of investing in Europe per se, but I feel like there's always this sort of valuation arbitrage between Europe and the U.S., both public and private. Um, and it always seems to me that most European companies always want to come to the U.S. We were involved uh, just recently with a company in the UC space where, you know, we did a financing when they were when they were 
or, um, called Abivax that was uh, trading in an ex-US um, exchange. We did it a pipe with a handful of high quality US investors, did another financing and then eventually part of the financing here in the US. And each time there was a bit of a step up, but really what it was all about is getting those US investors to sort of, for lack of a better word, validate um, right. You know these specialty investors, and it was again such an interesting process to work to to watch from the very beginning. Where the first transaction that we were involved in, we actually had to do something which was completely unusual, different, which is actually give part of the royalty to the investor, as opposed to a warranted transaction, right, for the lead asset. Um, and then again in the second transaction, um, a much larger transaction than ultimately an IPO. So again, Europe to uh, to the U.S. I think. You know, we work with a lot of European companies. Um, at the end of the day, I always feel, and I don't have the data in front of me, but I always feel there, there's this discount for whatever reason. Um, doesn't necessarily mean the science is any better or worse, but it just feels that way. Just to, to I mean, we, we would, uh, we do about 40% Europe, 6% US. Um, I, I think to, to Michael's point, probably a 30% uh, like for like, pre-money valuation difference being lower in Europe. So, and that's a reflection of a, a dearth of venture capital. It's kind of good news and bad news is, you know, pre-money is lower, but you've got to do a lot more work to build out um, these companies. I think just to pick up on, on Michael's point and, and just looking at some of the questions and thinking about the audience, um, I do think for, um, you know, bio, biotech companies in the current environment, I do think reaching out to farm is absolutely critical. Um, I think just thinking through, you know, what is the prize? What are the crown jewels? Discarding things that um, may not, you know, maybe marginal. But I, I think the, the, you know, relationships with farmers have changed out of all recognition. Um, and I think incredibly open to doing interesting deals. So, you know, we sold a couple of our companies to Takeda about 18 months ago that were built to buy deals whereby uh, they really like the, uh, the, the, the technology basically around gamma delta T cells. They put some non-dilutive capital in with an option to acquire. So fantastic outcome. It all worked out for all parties. I'm, I'm pleased to say, um, but I, I do think in the current environment, um, you know, we haven't quite touched on what you know what what's VC capital, what's VC fundraising like, because that's the other part of the ecosystem. And maybe I just while I'm talking, I'll, I'll say a few comments on that. I'm, I'm not going to refer to to Abingworth, um, but I just get you know general views. I think it has been a, a slower fundraising um, environment. Part of that's because it's been tougher to return capital, and I think all LPs have been overweight um, in privates, uh, certainly coming through. Um, some of the public market, um, obviously, pullback that um, you know many LPs have found they've been overweight in privates, not because the privates necessarily have done poorly, but because the public companies have come down. So I think that's certainly been a, uh, an impact. Liquidity back to LPs, I think, has been tough. Although I have to say, if you look at returns from uh, biotech VCs, it's pretty strong. And you know, we took it through the strategy we developed. We, we're returning capital pretty much uncorrelated to public markets. Um, not least because um, the M and A environment remains fantastically strong, but you know I think it is it, it is tougher um, to to raise capital based on you know the, our, our colleagues that we know well, but the good firms are raising. Um, it feels you know like some of the uh, the joint come ladies, if I can use that expression, a few years ago have uh, have realised that actually you know a, a you need a track record. Um, you know, some of the crossover groups who, you know, very important part of the ecosystem have backed away because there's, you know, they can't make the kind of returns given the IPO market is there. So there's certainly less capital um, going forward. Um, but I, I think, you know, the good companies and we've seen, you know, some of the groups, Forbians and uh, others have raised significant quantities of capital. So I think the good groups that are going to prevail, I think probably likely, <clears throat> you know, being a first time fundraiser uh, is pretty tough environment. Um, but I, I think, you know, broadly, we should all be very positive. Uh, valuations have not been impacted as, as much as many thought. Um, but I, I would say to any CEO and having been one for many years, um, you know, if the capital is out there, raise the capital now. I think things will improve. But I, I wouldn't, um, I, perhaps I would say this is a VC, but I wouldn't get too cute on valuation. I'd take the blooming money um, and get down the road. And, um, you know, I, I think Michael's absolutely right. I think the broad macro environment is really in our favor. Um, you know, we thought we were immune to what other industries were around interest rates. Forget it. We we are inversely correlated, almost one to one to interest rates, so, uh, as you would imagine. So I think remaining positive. But uh, you know, I think um, I think uh, getting close to pharma, really looking at your pipeline, 
Um, I, I think innovation, I think VCs, last point, then I'll shut up, uh, VCs are having to take more biology risk. Um, and I think we're comfortable to do that. There was a time where, you know, new modalities, you may, you know, look to apply it to a pretty well-known, well-validated target. I don't think we can do that anymore. So I think for many, you know, startup biotechs, that's a good thing um, because we are having to take, you know, some some senses, not only modality risk, but biology risk. If we get it right, then I think the returns and farmers' appetite is going to be fantastic and strong. But I think just a general comment, it was one of the questions in, in the list. So I'll, I'll stop there. No, no, you've done a great job of covering off a lot of those questions. That's really helpful. Um, Michael, maybe we could just ask your, your thoughts on that fundraising for VCs and other funds, and then we can perhaps spend a few minutes just on some of the other questions as well. Yeah, it, it's interesting here in the U.S., um, you know, um, it, it's definitely it's definitely tough run, raising capital. Um, First timers, um, folks that don't have, you know, numerous funds, et cetera. But it's also interesting interesting to us when we see some of these breakaways from these typical pods, whether it's Millennium, 0.72, whomever, multi-strat funds, guys going out and raising new money. Money seems to be flowing in. Um, there was an example um, of a company um, called Petricor, which is generally a debt fund that just raised a life sciences fund. They just raised 300 million bucks. Um, so, yeah, I don't, I don't um, it, it is not easy raising capital for sure, particularly for inexperienced folks that are going out and doing it um, for the first time. But it feels to me um, that there is a lot of money being allocated to this sector. It's also interesting. I was at the LSP conference or EQT conference a couple of weeks ago, and we had dinner with a handful of different um, VCs. And it's such an interesting dynamic to me that a lot of these private equity funds, as we've watched, come in and, and I don't know, fully buy or, or take a stake or become involved, right? There is clearly an interest there. Um, and so, Tim, I'd love to hear from you, your view of this, that's going to continue <laughs> if more of these guys are, are going to be scooping up the venture folks um, in Europe, because I think it's so interesting that they're interested in this sector. Yeah, I'll, I'll do it very quickly. I certainly want Thank Martin and Jane to add, add some comments. But, I, you know, we we became part of the Carlisle Group about 18 months ago. Um, and obviously they have, you know, softened over, sold up a piece. We sold the whole management company, um, you know, four billions a piece, LSP, the whole thing in essence. Um, I, I think there's a limited number of groups that will meet the private equity criteria. And that's really about deploying quite large amounts of capital. So you really need late stage capabilities. And we we and, and the others I've named all broadly have done, both in the public and the private sense. So I think that limits um, probably the, the pool of groups that private equity will look to go after. So I think there's really two reasons. Um, I, I think Carlisle would say Van Abingworth is A, that we we do quite a lot in late stage and actually we, won't, we don't have time to talk about the Inflation Reduction Act, but that's putting pressure on um, the number of clinical studies uh, companies are looking to run. Um, I think there's a, there's kind of a debt piece in there as well. So I think that's that that's part of it. I think the other piece is also providing expertise for the more traditional private equity type deals, be it you know CROs, um, CDMOs, etc. And we're certainly doing that. But I think I don't think you're going to see a massive number more. There may be one or two, but I think. Uh, you know, a number of the big groups, KKR recently did, did something. So, you know, if you kind of list the, the big groups, obviously Blackstone um, bought uh, Claris, our, our old friends at Claris some time ago. So I think many of them kind of place their bets in groups that are more later stage. I think we may be coming to the end of that. Um, uh, uh, but I, I think what it does mean is there's more, potentially more capital in, a, in slightly different fashions available for later stage assets. And I think the demand both from biotech, but increasingly from pharma to access ways that reduce EPS pressure on them, um, I think does mean that there's a greater role for private equity, loans, debts, et cetera, um, you know, royalty type phase. I think all of that stuff is really good. So, but uh, hopefully that um, it gives a bit of a, a perspective on, on that point. Yeah, and I think it's another fundamental, as you say, there's more groups now with capital and capabilities to do late stage development. Um, one of our companies has a partnership with Daiji Sankyo who have done that in a very interesting and very, very large scale way. And I think we'll see other, um, what used to be medium-sized pharma doing there, um, which I think takes us to our, our final uh, question. And we've got you know a few minutes to discuss this. So it'd be great perhaps just to dig into this a little bit. 
Now, is, is there a, we talked about dual track, but is there actually a, a the third track, the collaboration track? You know, can companies build out long-term strategic collaborations, which perhaps allows them to take one or more assets to market while partnering with others? Um, you know, some of you will remember Actilion. You know, when I was at Roche, we did a deal with Actilion. Novartis did a deal with Actilion. Lots of people did deals with Actilion, and they built that company out on this collaboration model. Um, is that something that we, we're seeing? Perhaps, uh, Jane and Marta, you, you, you would like to start, and then we can open it out a little bit. Yeah, and I, I mean, my view is that in particular, if it is a platform company, this is a, a an obvious way to go, um, because of I mean, especially if if there is a real opportunity to to segregate the the various um, collaborations and licenses that you engage with. I mean, we we uh, Novo Nordisk ended up um, we had a collaboration with Dyserna back from twenty eighteen. Uh, We've actually been been talking with that company since twelve. Um, so first of all, I mean, one take home message: keep the conversation going and have patience, build the relationships, and that's I mean, deals are made between people. So that um, that that ongoing um, relationship building and and keeping each other updated on strategic directions and and new developments is uh, is a good and strong starting point for a collaboration and then we entered into a collaboration and and we're, we were th three years into that collaboration um before we then decided um to uh, that the best the best way forward for both parties actually in that in that particular instance was an acquisition because we wanted to widen the the the, the collaboration so this is a, an example where where at the same time as we had a collaboration, many others uh, had and still have uh, collaborations uh, with with the and and are using the platform. So that continues, um, and and that continues to generate value for those uh, partners out there. So for sure, with platforms, it's um, it's it's a, an obvious, um, but also of course a dangerous space because you want to make sure that you are not. Uh, locking yourself in too much from from a therapy area perspective, or and, and keeping keeping the opportunity to uh, to to build that on. Um, if it is assets, um, and and of course, I mean split indications. That's just difficult. Um, and I think we've seen some examples in the past. Um, some some have attempted and and. Possibly, if there are potentials to uh, formulate in, in in different or even even different routes of administration, there is a way forward. But it is complex, and and the partners will always have to be intertwined somehow uh, in on the background IP. So it's not at all as straightforward. Um, and 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 maybe even sometimes some farmers may may back away because it just becomes too complex. But certainly collaborations in 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 many forms uh, also to explore and to de-risk assets um, is, is, a, is a good um, way. And, and we certainly have a lot of appetite to go in early if it is a novel innovation. I think there was a question on that as well. Yep. Um, new modality, which, which is unproven, then there is only one way to test it and that's to generate the data. And obviously if you can generate the data with something that is, is closer to what the strategic interest is in the long term, um that's that's even even more valuable so um so for sure um uh, collaborations that could eventually lead to to m a but but perhaps it doesn't doesn't necessarily have to yeah that no, that's really helpful marta yeah i think you know we have a quite a long uh track history actually of uh, entering into sort of long-term research sort of strategic alliances not all of them are publicly announced, so I will not go into the detail, but some of the sort of more recent examples, as I mentioned, is the targeted protein degradation deals with Proxygen and Amphista or AI powered drug discovery with Benevolent and Accentia as some examples, but uh, there are many, many more and actually uh, sort of date back quite extensively and have generated quite interesting optionality for our pipeline. So I think uh, I, I completely concur to what Jane has been saying. I think on the on the asset side also, uh, you know, we very often kind of, okay, sorry, maybe let me paddle back. If it's a sort of uh, company that has already a platform, but also, I mean, has a platform, but also has already some assets. Right. And sometimes as Jane also alluded to, pharma strategy change. We, for example, like to build an optionality to expand the relationship. 
So maybe we start with an asset, but it's fitting perfectly into the pipeline now, but also have an option to nominate additional targets, expand that uh, strategic collaboration, or actually the other way around, we start with, okay, the platform is validated for certain indications, but maybe these are not the indications that are currently of interest for us. Let's say they are already go undergoing clinical development, but we would like to focus on something else, but nevertheless, maybe we're interested to take an option, for example, into the lead asset or whatever. So I, I would say there is there are um, many uh, ways to build a creative deal and, and sort of maximize the relationship. And uh, usually when, you, when we start talking to the partners, we actively listen to what are their needs, what are their constraints, current, what, what are their main drivers, how they're looking to, to build their company, what are their goals, what are their, uh, the sort of uh, goals of the board, and then think what, what is it that we want to achieve and try to build a deal around the science and the needs of the of the two parties. So I think there is, there is big power in sort of sitting down and sort of drawing out all the options and then picking the ones that are mutually sort of uh, beneficial. No, that's really helpful. Thank you. Um, Tim? Sorry, caught you with just me. just on just on mute. Yeah, excuse me. Yeah, nothing nothing really much to to add. Um, uh, Arjun, I think uh, I think we've covered quite a lot of waterfront. I guess we're coming up towards uh, the hour. I think you know just to kind of reiterate um, Michael's start point is you know I think the world that does look pretty good, and I think our farmer colleagues you know really underwrite a lot of what we do. But I think as a a biotech CEO, it's a time to really think hard about where the funding is coming, where do you need to get to, uh, and what are the crown jewels. And, and I think, as, as we've heard from our, our colleagues, I think I do think, you know, build relationships with farmers out of the gates and really look through creative ways. I think um, you may give up, a little, give up a little bit of, you know, potential downstream value, but um, I, I think it's, uh, you know, we're in a very uh, fortunate environment where the relationships between biotech and pharma and indeed between those two and VC have never been stronger. So I think reaching out and, and I just echo what um, what Jane and Mark have said. Very good, Michael. Yeah, not that much for me either, except to just reiterate what Tim and Jane had said, because it's absolutely true. This is a people business. And when you think about these relationships, as our, our pharma colleagues just talked about, these are long discussions that take time and are very strategic. And, you know, when we think about our companies and working with our companies, you know, it's really all about giving yourself optionality because it's a broad picture. It's not just about farm. It's just not about raising capital. It's not just about who your investors, right? All of this has to be from a strategic place, right? And I think, again, reiterating what Jane said, it's a people business. It's so important for these management teams to have these discussions, to take good advice from high quality boards, to really understand strategically what the broader picture is for these companies. Um, so just reiterating what my colleague says, which is absolutely spot on as far as I'm concerned. Fantastic. Um, so, you know, I think we've covered a lot and, you know, as I said, it's people business, but we've been fortunate to have the four of you, I think, adding some great content here. So thank you on behalf of everyone. I think we've had over 150 viewers. Um, and Adam, I think we had the poll at the beginning, and I think the majority of people were positive. Do they remain positive after listening to the panel? Uh, indeed. Um, so let's see. Um, so I've just launched the same question once again, um, the exact same question from the start of the webinar. Uh, let's see if uh, the panel has uh, swayed anyone's opinions. Um, but yes, just to close up the webinar, um, we will just see um, what people think. Um, with just one minute left, uh, I can share the results um, from that final uh, poll. It does seem uh, that people's opinions have slightly shifted. Uh, it does seem as though uh, just over the course of the 60 minutes, uh, it does seem that the audience's uh, general positivity has increased. Uh, but once again, thank you so much for such a great webinar, uh, Mike, Marta, Jane, Tim, uh, and Ajahn.